Say altars, gates, and dimensions. These are things that gives you access point into the realm of the Spirit. These are things that is very much active in our lives, and you'll see it. We're going to take it from Genesis to Revelation. You'll see how it has played a pivotal role in the lives of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David. In fact, all the greats and generals that were used by God used a certain technology called altars and gates in order for dimensions to be shifted and changed, for their lives to be shifted and changed. Nothing is unattainable when it comes to God. Are you guys with me? Nothing is inaccessible when it comes to God. It is about being in the right position or having the right heart attitude. Let me, let me read you something. Put on the screen, I think it is Matthew 13, verse 10. Matthew 13, verse 10. Um, listen to, oh, let me read 11, verse 11. Listen to this. He answered and said to them, because it has been given, say with me, given, given. to you, to, to whom it has been given, say to me, Amen. to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. So we need to clarify who is the you and who is the them. Because there is a difference to whom the mysteries is given. The one can take this Bible, read it, and get squat out of it. The other one can read one verse, and mysteries are unlocked. That allows them to go into higher or different dimensions. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. It's called revelation. By the power of revelation, revelation shifts and moves you into another dimension. It is by revelation that we will break open and break down altars that are in Krugersdorp. Are you guys with me? Go with me to, go with me to Matthew 11, 25. Matthew 11, 25 or 24. Let's do 25. Listen to this one. Listen to this. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden. Say with me, hidden that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to the babes. Now hold on, I say to you, there are those who can receive mysteries whom it is given to and then there are those whom it is not given to. Say with me, mysteries. I need you to understand this. This book is not just an ancient book of good principles. This Bible goes beyond just being an ancient book of good principles. It is the inspired, God-breathed word. Meaning that every letter, every word, if you read it in the Hebrew, you'll see that every Hebrew, whatever you want to call it, pictogram type uh, letter, has three dimensions to it. It's got phonics, it's got, numer it's got numerics, and it has a prophetic image. So one Hebrew letter, or would, I don't know what they call it, maybe they call it a... Picto, uh, 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 hey? Is that a pictogram? Pentagram. Pictogram. <laughs> pictogram. So, uh, but every Hebrew letter consists out of phonics. It has a sound to it. It then consists out of numerics, a numerical value. It has a numerical value. Itself has a number, which is a different number. And then it has a prophetic meaning. Meaning that when you read the Bible... You read it in a multi-dimensional way. You can read one letter of a Hebrew word, and you can open that one letter up in a multi-dimensional way. That is why God is infinite. That is why His word is God-breathed. Nothing could have been written by man there or planned by man. It was written by holy men, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Are you guys with me? But it was the very signature of God. It was the hand writing of God that was written there it was God controlling and possessing people to write the Bible it is infallible perfect word of God because men has written it doesn't mean it is now fallible no 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 they were inspired of the Holy Ghost set apart by God and God literally took their hand possessed their hand and wrote it okay that even when Paul wrote letters to the churches for Paul, it was letters. For us, it's a Bible. For Paul, it was a letter to Timothy. Yet he was so anointed 
He was caught up in heaven so many times that he said it is unlawful for me to even speak of the experiences and the encounters that I had in heaven. It will be unlawful. And God, and everything he wrote was God breathed. And God said, that's going to become part of my word. That everything will pass away except the word of God. And Paul was put into a mere man, put into that category. Doesn't mean we can write our own Bible. Please don't try. Okay. But say with me dimensions. So Hebrew is multidimensional, written in a multidimensional way. It can be read in an infinite way when it comes to meanings. And why? Because God understood that how prophecy is spoken through the word, spoken through each letter. That is why we're going to it, especially going to the new year, and we're going to explanations of what it means and etc. But say with me again, say altars, say gates, say dimensions. This is very important. Where were we? Uh, put on the scripture that we were just now. Listen to this. So Jesus is said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise. So I said to you, who are those who do not get it and those who do get it? The previous verse says, the mysteries of the kingdom. He has given it to you to understand, to know. And to them, He has not given it to them to understand. So there are certain people whom God has shut their eyes to see any mystery. They can even sit here in the church here and it can go over their heads. God has not given it to them to understand. Are you guys with me? Say, but not me. If your heart is right, I'm going to explain it now. He says, you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent. Okay. So those who are wise in their own eyes. Prudent. I think prudent is a good word. It is these that are expected to know it. God is saying, I will not allow. I have taken it from them. But, and I've hidden it in a parable, but I've revealed it to, my, to them who are babes in the kingdom. What is a baby? It's somebody with a childlike heart. One of the first keys to revelation is childlikeness. What does a child do? A child forgives. A child loves. A child so easily forgives. A child forgets. Are you guys with me? A child shows kindness, shows love, shows acceptance. He's saying if you want the kingdom, and even if you want these mysteries of the kingdom, get into a childlike mindset or heart attitude. Are you guys with me? So go with me to Mark 4 verse 10. Let me just see if that's it. Verse 11. Listen to this. And he said to them, To you it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. Say with me, to me. It has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. Now hold on, we said, There are those to whom it was given and to those whom it was not given. Those whom it was not given are the wise and the prudent who expected them and everybody expected them to know it. You know, I get, I get attacked many times or mocked because of my accent or because of uh, maybe I'm not fluent in speech, but at least I know God. And those who, those who attack me or, or make crude remarks always, there's nothing, no evidence of God. They're probably sitting in their basement somewhere, living in their mother's house, writing on a keyboard. We have found out the one actually is in the basement. Okay. And uh, the other one is about two blocks away from here. We know where they live also. And uh, no money, nothing. They're going to get so angry. They said they're going to come and karate us here. So we said, come. They did say that. You know. You're just full of a devil. That's it. You won't even get your foot into the door. To you it has been given to know the mystery. Why can I talk like that? 
Because where the kingdom of God is, there's power. The kingdom of God is not in talk, but it is in demonstration of power. I have spent way too many hours, days, years with God. Oh my gosh, weeks in the secret place at a time. For somebody or to be taken out by somebody that will cause... Listen, listen, listen. My eyes have seen the glory of the Lord. And because my eyes have seen the glory of the Lord, that means if I minister to you, there can be a revelation that can be given to you. That's why many of you would have looked, you would have seen the face of Christ on the stage, manifesting on the stage here. Or you would have seen the smoke of the cloud of the glory coming into our services. You would see and you can go with a testimony and say, my eyes have seen the glory of the Lord, whether it's Shekinah, whether it is Kavot, whether it is healings, deliverances. Are you guys with me? Prophecy is coming to fulfill. What is it? It is the glory of the Lord. Lives getting saved, changed and touched. What is it? It is the glory of the Lord. The one night, I think it was one conference, we were standing here. And the Lord said to me, angels. In fact, I don't want to go as far to say what He actually did say to me. But let's leave it at angels. He said to me, angels will walk in. Now, and as we get to walk in, you saw, so everybody was standing, you saw this lines, groups going down under the power. And we're just standing on the stage. We didn't count one, two, three or nothing. Are you guys with me? Because, uh, so listen to this, listen to this. To you, it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. So we've established it that it's been given to you, but you first need to know who you are. You must be the one that is the babe. But then there's another secret to this thing. But to those who are outside, all things come in parables. Now there it is giving you another, um, uh, 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 another qualification and a characteristic of those who can't get it and those who can get it. Which tells you those who it has been given or on the inside. Those who it has not been given to. They cannot see. They cannot even understand the mysteries. They are on the outside. Now I can get theologically into the scripture which I'm not going to get into. I'm going to preach it revelatory. Are you guys with me? And allegorically, if I can say it like that, prophetically. Let me use a better word. Prophetically. That there are dimensions. Some are in a dimension. Some are outside of a dimension. That those who are outside cannot be given to what is in the dimension. And we're going to get into it tonight when we touch on gates and dimensions. This morning I'm touching still on altars to lay a foundation. Are you guys with me? An altar is a place where there's a spiritual interference, where, the, where heaven comes to earth and earth meets heaven. It is a transaction. It is generational. We're going to get into it right now and you're going to see the power of altars. Many people are suffering with sicknesses in their bodies or they're suffering with certain things and curses because an unholy altar has been built by their forefathers. Because altars don't die when the person dies. It is generational and it carries on. We'll see it in Abraham's life, Isaac's life, Jacob's life. We'll even see unholy altars in their life. Abraham lying about his wife. Isaac lying about his wife. Same situation. So you see an unholy thing. Exact, exact situation doing the same. And some people would ask, but why am I doing, I'm doing exactly what my father has done. Or I'm doing exactly what my mother has done. Or I'm doing, I just can't get over this thing. I just keep falling into this struggle, this battle. Maybe it is my mindset. Maybe I just feel my heart is hard. I battle to show love. Or I battle to, I just have to drink the whole time. Why are we doing it? Because there are people, they sit with generational curses. And the bedroom is dead. I'm serious. Please, it's okay. Your children hear much more in from primary school. It's, it's, they will be safe. Okay. Um, and, and you're thinking, but why can't I? There's an altar. There's something. Because you can, we can, we can throw, disregard it. We can disregard it and say, no, 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 this is natural. It's not spiritual. Well, you have tried everything and it's not working. Even gone from to psychologists, gone to doctors, 
uh, try to fix it yourself. Yet the heart is hard. Or you don't know how to have intimacy. Which means the problem must be spiritual. And the Holy Spirit said to me, that this morning I'm going to begin to break altars that are in people's lives. Tonight I will open up gates, says the Spirit of the Lord. will enter dimensions. But altars that has been erected, even in the city of Krugersdorp, that has bound many churches. It is altar versus altar. Power versus power. Paul's prophet's altar did not stand up to Elisha's altar. Elijah's altar. Are you guys with me? Have your seats. Have your seats. Which means that when an altar is built, power is released. The strength of power behind your altar is determined by the prayer and fasting and what you give into that altar in your house. And I'm not speaking of a physical altar. I'm speaking of a spiritual altar. I'm speaking of a place called the secret place. So listen to this. Out, say with me outside. Say inside. There are those who are in a dimension and there are those who are outside of a dimension. It is only the one that is inside that can open up for you. People can say, no, but God will open up for me. Okay, let's try it. God uses vessels. He uses portals, gateways. He uses uh, altars. And we see right through. In fact, when you read scripture, after today, to this morning and tonight, you're going to see altar and gates everywhere. Most of the places where the Bible uses the word door, and it's actually meant to be a uh, gate. Are you guys with me? And you'll see that gate is not a gate. It is also a person. It is also a demon. It is also a principality. It is also a watcher and an angel. Okay. Are you guys with me? It is also a physical location. But it is also a person that is used by God. That, can, oh, that becomes a gate for you to go into another realm. That the moment you get into contact with Him, and you can understand, but wait, this is the grace of God upon this person. And their soul is blessed. They have the ability to become a gate for you to go into success. Or a gate for you. Listen, if you sell cars, and you always sell cars, but you want to begin to, plot, to, to, to do maybe five or six of your own car sales, rental, uh, what do you call it, locations. And uh, 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 car rental locations. And, and you just sell cars out of your house, your backyard maybe. And you want to have these things. What takes you from there to there is meeting a person that gives you one key. What are they doing? They're becoming a gate for you. And maybe they know how to do it. They have done it. And they just tell you one, two, three. And all of a sudden, you have the ability to pass through. You can do it. This life is lived by gates and altars that takes us into dimensions. That is why association is so important. That is why you are the sum total of the five friends you hang around with. Your net worth is the net worth of the five friends you hang around with. Well, let me rather rephrase it. Your future net worth is the net worth of the five friends you hang around with. That is your prophecy, is the people you be are friends with. The Bible says it, which is the God-breathed inspired. But to those who are outside, say outside. I, whatever you do, make sure you are not outside. Are you guys with me? Make sure you are not outside. But this morning, we're going to deal with altars. Say this with me. Say, my altar will come down. Now, there are good altars and there are bad altars. And I want to explain this. Let's go to Exodus chapter number 20, verse 24. And I'm going to be ministering to people as well this morning. But let's go to Exodus 20, verse 24. Listen to this. An altar of the earth you shall make for me, says the Lord. And you shall sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep and your oxen. Now, listen to this. In every place where I record my name, I will come to you and I will bless you. Hold on. He says, you shall make an altar and a sacrifice. And where you make an altar and a sacrifice, I will record my name there. I will write my name in that place. When I write my name in that place, 
and you have made a sacrifice and an altar. And an altar without a sacrifice is not an altar. When I write my name, then he says this. He says, I will come. Say with me, come. And, the, and another translation says it powerfully. It says, I will come down to you. And I will bless you. Are you guys with me? It says, I will come down to you. And I will bless you. Meaning God will visit you where your altar is. So what is an altar? Listen, listen, listen. What is an altar? It is a place of slaughter and sacrifice. Uh, where blood was shed always. And death took place. It is a place of slaughter and sacrifice. Where blood was shed. And death took place. An altar requires death. Are you guys with me? And I'm speaking spiritually. Satanists knows better how to build altars and do sacrifices than Christians do. And you'll see the power that even the devil has when an altar is built for him. Why is there so many strongholds in cities? Many cities, before you drive in there, there's a huge monument erected of some evil deeds or evil thing that was done. Some blood that was shed. Are you guys with me? And it has a spiritual stronghold. And people can say, oh no, but you're just being spiritual. Well, the results are there. Because power is released there. And it has created a legal ground for spirits to operate. Let me explain to you. Are you guys with me? So it symbolizes an acknowledgement of an approach and an appreciation towards God or to another deity. In other words, it is worship or allegiance to God or to another deity. But it shows your allegiance. It shows your appreciation. It shows your acknowledgement. An altar is an intersection between the spiritual and the natural. It is a T-junction in the spirit. Meaning, it is a place where you come. And uh, when you get there, you change direction completely. Or when you get there, there's a clash and a collision of spirits and uh, spiritual and the natural. The supernatural and the natural. Are you guys with me? It is where the natural meets the spiritual. It is where heaven meets earth. Now, you're going to say, but where's the scriptures? We're going to get to it now. We're going to get to it now. I'm just giving you the definition of an altar. An altar is a gateway between the realm of the spirit and the earth realm that grants unhindered access to certain spirits being found as legal expression on that place. So, on the earth. It gives, once an altar is erected, whether good or bad, it gives unhindered access for spirits to enter into the earth through that place. Are you guys with me? If you deny this, you are not a Christian. Because this has literally been practiced from Genesis to Revelation. And wait till we get to gates tonight. And we'll show you how even a woman is a gate in Scripture. Why are women more spiritual than men? Why do we have 70% women or 60% women in the church? Yeah, I think we have 59, 60% women in the church and 40%, 41% men in the church. Why are men hard-hearted? But women are sensitive. They are a gateway. They are a gate. But how are they a gate? The moment they give birth, they are a channel and a gate for another human being to come from the spiritual into the natural, to come from heaven into earth. They are a channel for God's glory. So that is why many men get upset and they say, they say, but how, they say, but how can, you know, my wife is just so spiritual. She has been made that way. She's in communication with heaven. She's the channel that brings a person from the spiritual into the natural. You can't do nothing. I'm just using an example. Are you guys with me? An altar is a landing spot for the spirit on the earth. When I say spirit, I use spirit to use bad or good. 
There's only one good spirit, and that's the Holy Spirit. Okay? Just so this is not misinterpreted. Um, there's, but there are a lot of bad spirits. Whether, which old, doesn't matter which altar it is, there can be bad or good coming through there. But where's the scripture for that? What if they build an evil altar? Well, the witch of Endor. Was it the witch of Endor? Yeah. Built an evil altar. And a good spirit came through there. Was it the witch of Endor? With Samuel coming through there. So let, let, let's leave you that one. Just for those who say that I don't preach scripture. Okay. Then you have a man called Baal. I'm oh, sorry, Balaam. Balaam. And he uh, confuses me because the Bible calls him a false prophet. Yet, he was one who would curse the armies of God. He's a false prophet. He would do everything for money. Yet, he had this ability on him. Now, this confuses me because it tells me in what business or contract are we in here with God? Because he is a false prophet, known in the Bible as a false prophet. Yet, he... Uh, he would speak to the army and the king would speak to him and he would say no no let me just go and inquire of the lord just stay here while i go i get the answer for you i come back then we see him go and then the bible says this and the lord comes down to him to talk to him but he's a false prophet god talks to him and then he goes back and he says what god has said so the Bible will mess you up. It's very, so that's why I say to people, don't always scream and shout like you know everything. A lot of people are so rigid in, in, in you know, uh, we have this rule book. One, two, three, it must be like this. No, 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 no. I'll pull scriptures out that will confuse you. So what contract, what deal, what was it that God would leave heaven to meet with Balaam? But yet he doesn't even do it with other prophets that were mentioned in the Bible. So, there's dimensions that we can enter. Then you have people that are generals that become gates. And they can allow or disallow things. And many people have been disallowed even areas of ministry in their lives. Because of somebody else that is closing a gate. Because God has given it to them. For them to choose. And they will give a judgment. They will give an account one day. Are you guys with me? That's why you will see revival in a lot of nations or not revival in a lot of nations. That's why you'll see, let's say, in the nation of South Africa, it has been shut down for how long? Why? Because many of your previous generals or pioneers, many of them that are still alive, what are they? They are holding things like this. They're too scared to even, and I know this for, for real, they're too scared to even talk to anyone, too scared to let anybody be on their pulpit too scared to be in any relationship with anyone lest my kingdom is going to be taken and revival is shut up because the Bible says where the brethren dwells in unity there I command my blessings and the oil will flow from the head to the beard to the shoulders to the garments which means that their revival will break out but once that is not done and people are selfish or individual they are selfish they are holding on they can literally close a gate for others to come up. South Africa is, I said one day, I said, you know, it's not my enemies who are my enemies. My enemies are usually those of my own household. And somebody asked me, what do I mean? And so on. And I said, you know, in South Africa, we have this disease. And I think you only realize, I don't know if it is the same in business, but it's definitely there in ministry that there's this disease the moment you come up somebody wants to pull you down you get to another you get to other countries the moment you come up they push you up in south africa you come up they pull you down now that's why it's enemies of your own house because of jealousy and no, not the ability to celebrate to rejoice with someone else's success are you guys with me so so let me, let me, let me, uh, let me, let me, I want to give you a little definition. An altar is an altar because of the presence of a sacrifice. Meaning it is not an altar if there's no sacrifice. 
the realm of the spirit wants to interact with the realm of the earth legally and vice versa because the inhabitants of the earth know without the realm of the spirit they are limited in the possibilities that they can produce they call for the assistance of these spirit beings now please what i take i take out of a theological book okay so when we speak spiritual beings you know what i'm speaking about the holy ghost or evil spirits or the spirit of Samuel according to the Bible okay so uh, that we have seen that has come up but you understand what I'm saying I'm not saying that we allow other spirits but altars can give legal way for other spirits somebody erecting an altar against you a sacrifice against you what is that it is me taking the mic here walking talking I make a remark maybe to somebody on there maybe I don't maybe I just preach scripture as and and there's somebody that is sitting let's say uh, watching and they would and they curse every step we take and they say these words and I've heard them say it we'll do anything to make sure he comes down in Kruger's Dorp what has they what have they just done they've paid a price they've made an agreement an allegiance with an altar that is erected against my life at that moment that is why you cannot do this thing without the grace of God nobody can start a church without the grace of God you'll be finished before you even start it if God is not for you if you're not able to withstand these type of things and I'm speaking dimensional like I said remember for some it is given to understand for others it is not given to understand so if you don't understand take it with God don't take it up with me uh, don't be upset with me but I pray that in this house revelation will open your eyes it will remove scales it will cause your spirit to leap that you will walk out of here and say but wait I have never heard this before there's something new that's fresh in my spirit say altars have your seats have your seats listen 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 altars is transactional say with you transactional altars is generational in nature altars is a spiritual portal the enemy fights you from a place called an altar when Goliath was fighting David Goliath was fighting from a place called his altar that's why he said by the birds of the air by this and by that because he was cursing him by the gods that he has by his altar and David says no 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 I have a covenant with God so when Goliath moved into the spiritual and David realized this man is using the power of an altar I need to use the power of my altar what is the power of my altar when I was on the backside of the desert watching over my father's sheep and I worshiped God every night I worshiped them and I worshiped them and I worshiped them until I was anointed by the prophet Samuel to be king. But I was he, was, he was in a relationship with God, and that prayer that was deposited, that worship that was deposited, caused power to back him up and take out the altar of Goliath. The problem is, not everybody has the same power to take out that altar. This altar put the whole armies of Israel to fear. Are you guys with me? When that altar comes, when they operate in that power, everybody around them, a whole army was put to fear. Didn't want to speak against the giant. Yet David comes and he takes it out. Why? He had an altar. And the power that was backing up his altar was stronger than the power that was backing up Goliath's altar. As I said this year, how important it is for us to build an altar in our houses are you guys with me to build an altar in our houses build a secret place build a secret place listen an altar summons the spiritual it is a place where the supernatural meets the natural where divinity meets humanity it is a place where God dwells it is a place where angels gather are you guys with me say with me this say I am an altar a person is an altar why no spirit can legally operate on this earth without the body of a human being okay 
so you can become an altar. And the Bible says that we live our, give our bodies as a living sacrifice. Why? So that the Holy Spirit can possess us, can come upon us, and we are a living altar wherever we are going. Are you guys with me? Say with me, my altar. Say my altar. Listen, all these guys, like I said, the persecutions and all these things that come, at the end of the day, the only thing it proves is whose altar is stronger. This altar here is not a pulpit and it is not a stage. A stage is for entertainment. A pulpit is just a name we've made. But it is an altar. Why do we let people bring their money to the front? Altar. You're sitting there in your chairs and we're just giving you a thing there. I, I, altar. There's something holy. When you take this mic, some will shake like they are going out of fashion. When you worship, when you praise, what is being built? An altar is being built. When you give, an altar is being built. When we pray, intercede, and we have many intercessions. I think just this Saturday we had 130 people praying in our two branches. Plus we had, uh, sorry, even our other branches, just in our two branches. And we had, I think, 97 people praying apart from that during the week. We have prayer. So what is happening? That prayer is building this altar here. So that when we minister to you, it can be from the Spirit. There can be a gateway. Where there's an altar, there's a gateway. A gate. Where there's a gate, there's another dimension. The only way how miracles, signs and wonders comes into a place is if there is an altar that has been erected there. Are you guys with me? So yes, there is power in this altar. I don't have a pig's head buried here like some said. But there is power here. Because it is a holy altar. We don't just let somebody come on here that is false and take a mic and preach. We don't just let anybody that is coming from uh, the crowd and they, they just want to say, no, I want to prophesy. We give them many churches all like that. That's why there's no power. There's no holiness. Revival will come when the fear and the holiness of God returns. You'll see in Kruger's door, when, when I say holiness, a people that are saying, I want nothing to do with sin anymore. Yes, I'm sin. Yes, I'm, I'm going to mess up. But I just want to seek the face of God. I am hungry for His presence. I am thirsty for Him. Holiness is the direction you are pointing at, not the lack of sin you are doing. Are you guys with me? Holiness is the proximity and direction. How close you are to the Lord and what direction you are looking at. It is where your heart is. The only way revival can come is when a people is pointed at that direction where they can become an altar. Or they build altars. They can become a gate. Which means that if we might come in the city of Krugersdorp and they said we'll take you out in Krugersdorp. Or nothing will happen here. The thing is, if you are fighting me, make sure there is no God behind my altar. Um, if I've prayed for 15 years, 10 years, fasted, praying, fasting like it's going out of fashion, you think God is not going to back me up? So before you fight a man of God, any man of God out of there, first know the power of their altar behind them. Because it is the power and the voice of their altar that will speak for them. You will end up fighting God. Are you guys with me? That is why it is no match for us in Krugersdorp. We are just, the only thing we were delayed with was lockdown. It's going to be like this. And the stronghold will be broken. And the altar will be broken in this city. And you'll see that freedom will come upon you. It's going to be like things like you will just feel like peace. That is, listen, listen, listen. Have you seen, have you seen? This is why it is so important to have mega churches. I'm going to say it again. It is important to have churches. When I say mega churches, I speak of large churches. Large churches and cities. Why? It is an altar erected, a memorial erected for the things of God, forever telling the enemy that we own that property and we take that territory. Altars are territorial in nature. God puts an altar and He lets man put an altar because He wants to take a territory. 
Are you guys with me? He wants to take a territory. So altars are territorial. So they're territorial. Number two, altars are transactional. So they're transactional. Meaning that uh, 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 it requires something from you before it gives. Elijah had to put pots of water on the altar and fire was given. It was required for him to give of that which he didn't, which there was a drought from. If you give death to an altar, it'll give you life and power. Are you guys with me? If you give into an altar, finances, it deals with poverty. It is an offering to God. Whatever, see, I'm speaking spiritual. Please don't go home and put a prayer shawl and a little cross, and that means nothing. That symbolism it can begin to get dangerous because somehow subconsciously we can think there's power in there. I'm simply speaking of an altar in your life, a place that is dedicated to God. It can, I, I, I speak of a physical place. Jesus went out into the wilderness on his own, Jesus went out. At night on his own to go and pray he had a place of prayer but have a place in your house where there is so private no one gets there or even when you're there your phone is off why begin to build an altar there and you will see that God lives and dwells there the moment you step into there you don't have to lift up your hands and wait for God to come he is there God lives by an altar. He dwells by an altar. I'm speaking of His manifest presence, okay? I know His presence is everywhere. God, His presence is everywhere. King David says, where can I go from your presence? Even if I go into the depths of hell, you are there. If I go across the seas, you are there. So yes, His presence is everywhere, but not His manifest presence. He's looking to find a place where He can have unhindered access and communication to you. How do you think men of power are being raised? Generals of God. How do you think the anointing comes upon somebody and they are just being used for the glory of God? Whether it is in prophecy or signs, wonders and miracles or as an evangelist or they go around the world or they, they are just being used by God. It's in that place. Then you can have ministers. They can lay hands. They can do anything. There is squats. I can get now for you some of the most famous ministers in this nation. And they'll stand here, and I'll get you to stand, and I'll say to them, lay hands. Now, out of your dignity and out of your humility, you might just th throw a courtesy drop. Okay. <laughs> but if I ask you not to do it, to do it real, they will lay hands. Nothing will happen. Nothing. They don't have an altar. They don't have a secret place. They don't have a place where God can meet with them unhindered undistracted that is where favor and grace comes upon your life when you sit in that place I don't care it's not a place we have to pray in tongues in 10 hours no it is just a place where you can just be you're just sitting there your thoughts your conscience everything knows this is the place where God dwells and your spirit is open but you've dedicated that place unto God. You will get communication from heaven like you've never seen before. You will walk out of there with grace and favor on your life. It is called the secret place. The place of the shut door in the New Testament. You have to shut everything out. Are you guys with me? So altars is territorial. So with the territorial. So we are, what are we do, doing in Krugersdorf? We are building an altar to take down the satanic altars in mountains and everywhere in this region. Otherwise, you cannot see revival coming. I'm telling you, you'll see people dead, depressed, suicidal. But once that heavens is broken open, once that altar is established, you'll see a shift in the atmosphere. You'll see prosperity rise up in the city. Every area will be blessed. Some people have no altar. That's why they're battling. Then they crash here, then they crash there. They, are, they can be flicked over with a little finger like this. Just one little trouble can come to them. And they fall to pieces and cry. They want to give up. 
They can take the microphone and sing once, and then all hell breaks loose afterwards. Or they can take a microphone and preach, and then all hell breaks loose afterwards. Where's the altar? Or life comes to them, they lose their job maybe. They fall to pieces, they don't want to serve God anymore. Somebody speaks something bad of them, they fall apart. They can be flicked over because there's no altar, there's no power that is being built on the altar, in the altar behind, there's no power behind the altar. Are you guys with me? The altars are weak. There's no prayer, no fasting, nothing. So say this with me. Say an altar is a system of authorization. It authorizes spirits to come into the earth, whether good or bad. And what I mean by good is the Holy Spirit. But also it authorizes bad to come in. So altar is territorial. So with the territorial. It governs territories. The Bible says in Genesis 26 that Isaac sowed in that land. And the moment he sowed in that land, he became a territorial commander. That even the king had to come and beg him and said, please, can you just leave our country friendly? We don't want to touch you or anything. We are jealous of how you're being prospered. You are greater than us. You have become a territorial commander. Why? An altar that was built. Are you guys with me? It's territorial. Meaning, how do we, we take Kruger's door? How? By starting at the church. But there's reasons to territorial. You have to do Jerusalem, then Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. A lot of people want to go out and start their own ministries without fulfilling it in Jerusalem. Are you guys with me? Kruger's door is fond and famous of that. Do you know how many ministers and ministries we've had coming here through the church? What are you doing? I have my own ministry. Oh, okay. Uh, what do you do? Like, no, I have my own ministry. Where? In my living room. Go for it. How many souls have you gotten saved? Uh, what difference have you done? Uh, how many people have you discipled? No, you know, we are a prophetic ministry. An intercession ministry. Just shh. Get into a local church. It starts by Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria, then to the ends of the earth. God will expand you. But it starts with the faithfulness. That's why many, 99.9% of ministries that doesn't do through local church doesn't go anywhere. Show me one and I'll be surprised. Just one that has risen up. Show me one great man of God that has raised, raised up, that was raised up without the local church. There's not one. Not one. It's against God's protocol. Altars. Or oh, where angels gather. Simply where angels gather. Meaning that once you build an altar at home, please, not, don't go build an altar. I'm speaking of a place. We have to explain because we have some people on Facebook and YouTube and so on that's not too intelligent. Okay. Um, and uh, you, you're intelligent, but them are there or not. And I'm going to say you must build altars. And I'm going to have a secret altar where I sacrifice to the devil. And that's how I get the powers. And we've been accused of that. No, we do sacrifice. And we do have an altar. Just to El Elohim. The Most High God. That's all. So altars are where angels gather. We see in Genesis 28 verse 10. Where Jacob... The Bible says that Jacob came there, was alone at night, and he immediately saw a ladder. He had a, dream, he had a dream and he saw a ladder from heaven to earth, and angels ascending and descending. And he said, this is none other but the gateway of heaven. The house of God. The gateway of heaven. How awesome is this? The presence of the Lord is in this place, and I did not even know it. Where there's an altar here, you can bet no one is going to come and just try to do anything here. There's a thing called the authority of the Holy Ghost. We've had many people try to do things. They are arrested in the Spirit. 
Because God is mightier than just what we can think or see. We've had people coming us like this. I was on a stage like this, and they ran with knives, and they come with guns. And one person was standing with a gun behind me, assigned to kill me, a big person. Seven of them planted. The pastor is so scared. He's nowhere to be found. But yet they are after me. So I'm left there, and the guy is standing behind me with a nine mil right like this. And the church is not doing anything. I tell them, there's a guy standing with a gun behind me. And they just go silent. Because why? We had threats this week. The guy said, we're going to come. Seven of us are coming to shoot you in that church. That was when we were really moving fast. And they came. His nine-year-old daughter gave him the gun in the bathroom out of her moon bag. And he walked with that into the church while the church service was on. He stood right behind me. Now you must understand that demonic power behind you. You need to know God there. The man was frozen. He just stood there. He could not do anything. Worship, he just stood there holding his gun like this. He couldn't raise his, raise his hands. I'm standing there in front. I'm not even preaching. And people are protecting everybody else except me. Okay. And, uh, and the guy came for me. And uh, I'm standing there. And, uh, and eventually, d- during worship, I remember I was worshiping God. And as I was worshiping God, it felt like there was this bubble of protection around me. And the man was frozen. He couldn't do anything. If your life is an altar, angels will be around you. God will dwell with you. His manifest presence will be there to protect you. The power and the authority of the Holy Ghost will be upon your life. Are you guys with me? So let let me me finish this. Let me finish this. Altars is where God switches sides. Go to 2 Kings 3 verse 26. 2 Kings 3 verse 26. It is a transactional place. It is a place where God chooses where he wants to be by virtue of sacrifice. And when the king Moab saw the battle was too fierce for him, he took with him 700 men. Say with me 700 men who drew swords to break through to the king of Edom. But they could not. So he took 700 choice men of war and battle. To destroy, this is a king, to destroy this battle, this army in front of him, and they could not do it. Next verse. Then he took his eldest son, who would have reigned in his place, and offered him as a burnt offering upon the wall. The Bible is cute, eh? As a burnt offering, he burnt his own son, hanged him on a wall, a satanic ritual and sacrifice human sacrifice and there was great indignation against Israel listen to this great indignation against Israel so they departed from him and returned to their own land what happened here was Israel was winning the Moabites given as a word of the Lord and uh, given to them by the word of the by prophet that they will win this battle and they began to win this battle and they were coming for the king the king had a big army left and the king was sending this army out towards Israel to stop them and as he sent the army out to stop them he failed so what 700 choice men could not do one altar and sacrifice could do in blood there is power let your offering be blood. And what I mean by that, let it hurt when you do something for the Lord. Let it take some time. Let it take some energy. Let it take money. Let it take something of you. Family time, whatever it might be. But when you are in your place of your altar, God knows it is costing you to be there. Once you are bleeding, in that sense I mean bleeding, power is deposited upon your life. Are you guys with me? And there's a spiritual power that is released against your enemies. That we see even here God switching sides. And the Israelites losing this battle. Because somebody decided to do a great sacrifice. 
when God looked at the sacrifice as evil as it was, it reminded him of his son's sacrifice. Now we can debate whether there was evil power that pushed him away or good power. That's beside the point. Are you guys with me? So altar say with me is transactional. As I said, Elijah had to pour water to get fire. Power will require death. Prosperity will require giving. Are you guys with me? Altus, last one almost. Say with me, is generational. This is important. I want you to listen to this. Altus is generational. Uh, go through to Genesis 8 verse 20. Genesis 8 verse 20. Listen to this. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a, sm a soothing aroma. Then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, day and night shall not cease. So, so read, read there for me. Say with me this. Say, so God blessed Noah's sons. Go back to verse uh, 8 verse 20. Does it say Noah's sons built an altar? Noah built an altar to the Lord. Go back to where we were now. I think it was 9 verse 1. So God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Go through to Mark chapter 10 49. Mark chapter 10 49. Listen to this. It's generational, meaning that this altar does not die with a person. It carries on, whether a negative altar or a positive altar. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Then they called the blind man, saying to him, Be of good cheer, he is calling you. And this is blind Bartimaeus. And throwing aside, wait, 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 where are you guys now? And throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. So Jesus answered him and said, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, Rabboni, that I may receive sight. Then Jesus said to him, go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. Are you guys with me? Go with me to, go with me to 1048. I'm looking for something here. Zerano. Yes. Yes. This is what I'm looking for. Go with me verse 47. Say with him, blind Bartimaeus. So we see here, this is the story of blind Bartimaeus. Are you guys with me? This means he had no name. That's what it means. The, I'll, I'll explain now the verse there. If you look at the phrase blind Bartimaeus, he was known as blind Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus means bar, which means son of. Timaeus means Timothy, Timaeus. So he was son of Timaeus, but he was not having his own name in his name. Are you guys with me? Like Bar Jesus, son of God, had to replace uh, uh, Jesus when it comes to the crucifixion. Uh, which is why I say Bar Jesus, Bar Abbas. Bar Son Abbas of God, Son of the Father. Bar Jesus. Who is the Son of God? Jesus. Okay. So um, he, he, there had to be an exact duplicate, if I could say it like that, to replace who would go to the cross or who would be free. So now we see Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, but he has no name. And listen how he calls Jesus. And when Barn Bartimaeus heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, say with me, Son of David, 
have mercy on me. Listen, he said, son of David, knowing his name was son of Timaeus. And he said, this blindness has not come from me. It came from my father. There was an altar that was built in my family beforehand where this sickness and this curse as a generation came down. So I need to address it by its roots. So I'm calling you as the son of David because I am son of Timaeus, meaning it's altar versus altar, power versus power. If you need healing in your eyes, you cannot go to a church that is dead. If you have deliverance that is needed, you cannot go to a church that doesn't believe in deliverance. He knew that Jesus knew the power of an altar, knew what David did. Are you guys with me? So he addressed him in that manner. Please stay, stay with me. Altars are generational. Stay with me, generational. And then we have the negativity with this blind Bartimaeus. Blindness came from his family, if you study this. And how that curse and altar was affected there. I refuse. Why do I am I so severe on the subject of altars? I refuse for any curse or generational curse, whether it is poverty, sickness, whatever it might be, to pass through me and go to my children. If my whole family has battled with one thing, I am the curse breaker and the altar destroyer at that moment. I refuse. They asked me this question. They said, why do you preach prosperity? I said, I refuse for God's people to be poor. And I refuse for my family to have nothing when my life is over. I believe we serve a God that will prosper us. That wants to prosper us. And no devil or religion will steal that away from me. It is everything anti-God. Anti Listen, poverty is everything antithesis of God. Are you guys with me? It's a religious, godsdienstige spirit that wants to make you poor, keep you poor. They don't even want to use the word finances. They now use, you know, different wording. I'm not going to say just not to offend. Let's call it, uh, you know, we are generous. Don't use prosperity, use generous. Don't use finances, use economy. No, listen, I say what the Bible says. I'm not here to be politically correct to people. I'm here to minister to those who say they want change in this area. They, that are my crowds. The ones that are against me, they're not my crowds. I don't, couldn't care what they say. I couldn't care of the criticism. But one thing I know is that God wants to bless you. You can break, break the altar that has bound you. Even in families before. Are you guys with me? We can go with altars. I mean, if you look at Abraham. Building an altar at a place. Abraham had four altars that was built. One for peace, one for prayer, one for praise, and one for prosperity. The one that was built for prosperity was the one where he used Isaac as a sacrifice. And it was Isaac that reaped a hundredfold in that same land. Altars are territorial. Then you see Abraham getting to a place. As he came back from Egypt, the Bible says this. That he walked towards Ai, went past a place called Ai, just before he came to a place called Bethel. And then the Bible says, at, just before he came to Bethel, where? At Bethel, where he made and built an altar. So then we see Abram, Isaac, and we see Jacob walking and coming to a place of Bethel, having a nap and a sleep. And suddenly he has a dream and he sees angels beginning to ascend and descend. At the very place where his father or his father's father, Abraham, built an altar. Why has no one else experienced any experience there? They were not in the bloodline. Others could have slept there and they would not have experienced anything. Jacob, because he's in the generation of the seed of Abraham. Meaning altars are generational. That altar was waiting for Jacob to get there. And the moment he was there, he had this dream and he saw the angels and the angels were there from long before, from Abraham already. 
Are you guys with me? Right after that, we see a battle and a war that was taking place between Ai and Bethel. And at the place where the altar was built, the battle was won. Why? So with the altars. There are reasons because of things happening and things not happening. Somebody can do something like this and a business deal can get done. Others can strive on the same business deal and can get nothing done. What is it? Altars. Dimensions. There are people that can preach their whole lives and they might never move in power. Or they can never fill their churches. They can never have a move of God or revival. What is the difference? Altars, gates, associations. Who are you transacting with? Transacting with? Where are you transacting? Do you have a place where you can transact with God? Do you have gates in your life who is people who are operating other dimensions that can take you into a dimension? It's nothing that is worked out. It is a knowing in your spirit. It is just an association. The moment you meet that person, something happens inside of you where your spirit stretches. Are you guys with me? May this church here be an altar and a gate that when you come in, may your spirit, may your heart be open. May it feel like heat in you. May you see angels ascending and descending. And those who do not understand, you may not never understand. Those who do understand, may it be given to you what? The mysteries of the kingdom. That when you walk out of here, may the scales of your eyes be falling off. May your heart be open to the glory of God. What is His glory? It is that fullness that comes into your spirits. The anointing and the glory is discerned. Have your seats, have your seats. Are you guys with me? Let me, let me kind of like close there. Uh, let me let me close there. Um, I want to minister to you, but uh, before I before I do that, say with the altars. We don't have much time. Um, <laughs> you see that place you create in your room, in your house, in your garden, wherever. Have a place that is you and God. It is so important. It's a place where you know, where God knows you mean business with Him. Where the devil knows you mean business with God. Where people know that if you go there, something is going to happen. It's there where you build your relationship with God. It is there if somebody touches you or try to mess you up. They are finished because you have that place. They are not touching you. They are touching your altar. They are touching your secret place. Are you guys with me? They are messing with the God that is behind your altar. They are messing with the God that is dwelling in your secret place. I'm speaking about a personal relationship with God. Yes, we can talk to Him when we're sitting here. We can, t and the sound is so horrible here. So for those poor souls that are sitting here, we are very sorry. I think it is better from here. Is it better from here? Does it sound double? I think it's just because I'm talking into it here, eh? Okay. Do you guys hear double or not? Yeah? Not? Yes? Not? Okay. Okay. It sounds for me like because I'm talking into the mic. Yeah. Um... I'm speaking about a personal relationship with God. I'm not speaking about funny altars and funny business. Don't go do voodoo stuff. I'm speaking about a relationship, a place where you can get on your knees and you can lift up your hands and there's no distraction. There's no phone ringing. It's you and God. And then you go 12 o'clock at night and you sit there from 12 till 2 and you see what happens. 
If you want to have an encounter, we say we are hungry for God. I doubt we are hungry if you haven't prayed through the night. Seeking His face. Why? Just because you love Him. Now people pray, they say they pray two hours for a car. I prayed eight hours a day just for His presence. Just for His glory. Not for a car or a house. It was never on my prayer list. I just wanted His presence and His glory. Years after years, there was a time when it was strict. Eight hours, I'll be praying. No interference, no distraction. Now you want to come against my altar? Or you might see us blessed with a car or blessed with a house. But you don't know what we have done. There's power in our past. There's a history. And those things are still not on our prayer list. The only thing that is on my prayer list is when it comes that I want more of God. I want to be in His will. I want to know how to, how to guide you more better. How to counsel you better as a flock and what right decisions to make. But above all, I seek His presence. Above all, I seek His glory. Above all, all I want is a fresh hunger. His glory is attracted, not entertained. It takes a heart attitude, a spiritual position, and a spiritual uh, 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 a position in here on how, whether you receive the glory of God or not. If you don't have the ability, which I call your spirit man, myself, I call it a prophet man, or we could call it your knower, but it is that feeling right here in your diaphragm. Where Jesus says rivers of living water will flow out of. It is where your spirit is located. If you don't have the ability to surrender and attract the glory of God, you need to spend more time in our services. There'll be a moment we'll be activated like this. And you'll just know how to pull the, and be, you become attractive towards God. It is that which pulls in the glory into a place. And it keeps Him there. And then you begin to learn stuff. It is in the night watches when you're alone from 12 till 2 or 12 till 3 in the morning. And you're in your place where God dwells. It is there where you learn these practical things. Where you see angels. Uh, let me not go too far. I understand that theologians don't understand. And it's good that we understand that. And as long as they can understand that they don't understand, then it'll even be better. I minister to you here from a place of an altar I have. You have to be tapping into a dimension to minister supernatural and spiritual things to people. You cannot give what you don't have. Are you guys with me? Say with me altars. So I spent hours and hours seeking not for a car, not for a house. Things were never on my mind. The only thing was the presence of God. The anointing. Oh my God, I prayed 10 years for the anointing. Fasted 21 days, 40 days, 21 days. Just to knock somebody over in the spirit. Not even speaking of miracles. Just in those beginning days, kind of like it's so rare. 